This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to Mental Dental. This will be our second video on these case set type questions and we're going to go over this time six practice questions all for the same patient and they'll be questions from all different kinds of topic areas but they will be applied to the same patient so you get to think through how you would manage that case. All right, so let's start with our first question. So we have in this case set a 10 year old male and his parent says that this child is snoring at night and wakes up tired. Background and or patient history has mouth breathing listed as well as obstructive sleep apnea. So from a functional matrix theory perspective, you would expect each of the following characteristics in this patient except one, and which is the exception. So go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. Okay, so the functional matrix theory is one of the three main growth theories in orthodontics. And this one was postulated by Melvin Moss, and he thought there's environmental growth control. In other words, things like chewing, speaking, and other functions cause the nasal and oral cavities to get bigger, which serve as the primary determinants of growth for the maxilla and the mandible. So the soft tissue matrix determines growth and the bone and the cartilage follow. A really good example of this is the growing brain, pushing the skull bones apart and the sutures react to the pressure to allow that skull to expand. So if we are to believe this functional matrix theory, which the question is asking us to do, breathing in and out from the mouth, as it says here, maybe due to some nasal obstruction, let's say, will cause a disturbance in equilibrium forces and subsequently a few key facial features. So the lips would tend to be open at rest to allow the air to come in and out. So we can rule out option E right away. The patient's face would also become elongated and the mandibular plane would become steeper as the facial muscles stretch and weaken over time. So that would rule out A and B. And the palatal vault grows higher and the maxillary arch tends to get narrower. So C would be out as well. So those characteristics I just listed are known as adenoid facies. And someone with hypertrophic or big adenoids may be mouth breathers because their nasal airway is obstructed somewhat and then have certain facial features as a result of that obstruction. So the correct answer here is D, this should say extruded upper molars instead of upper incisors. So the mouth is, you know, propped open at rest. The upper molars would then erupt into that extra freeway space, propping the mouth further open, hence supporting this long facial growth pattern. So the answer here is D. Okay, question number two. Which of the following is not a risk factor of obstructive sleep apnea in children? So go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So I suppose this is kind of a spoiler for the future questions in this video, but this case set, we're really honing in on obstructive sleep apnea. So most of these questions are going to be about OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, to some degree. Now you might notice this on the board exam. There are some case sets that'll just hone in on one specific feature of the patient box or one particular thing and then ask you know, from different topic areas, from oral pathology, orthodontics, from ethics, pharmacology, but all tackling that same thing. So all coming at obstructive sleep apnea from different angles. Now other case sets, and I'll have examples of this as well in future videos, will kind of be all over the place. They'll pick apart something from the chief complaint and then something from the background and something from the current findings. So you'll see both kinds of case sets, ones that are really honed in on something specific and then ones that kind of go more broad and all over the place. 
So with that being said, let's talk about this question. We're being asked to figure out which of the following is not a risk factor of obstructive sleep apnea, specifically in children as this patient is a child. So A, mandibular retronathia. So a retronathic mandible, as you would find in a class two patient, is notoriously more at risk of OSA because their anatomic airway might be a bit limited in size. It's more likely that soft tissue is straining for space during sleep because the mandible is set back and that tongue is going to be further back in the mouth as well. Now, skeletal anatomy is not the only contributing factor to OSA, but it is a consideration, so we can rule A out here. Hypotonia of the pharyngeal ring. So hypotonia means low muscle tone or strength. So weak muscles around the pharynx or throat means that the patient will struggle more maintaining airway patency or openness during sleep. So this is certainly a risk factor as well. I'm going to skip down to D for a second. Obesity means more fat deposits, particularly in the tongue area and the pharyngeal region. Again, just more stuff back there, putting pressure on and constricting the airway. So that is also a risk factor. Now for the age consideration. Age two to eight is actually the highest risk group for children because after that age, around nine years old, the lymphoid tissue involutes and shrinks relieving some of that pressure around the airway at the back of the throat as the tonsils shrink and get smaller. So this is actually not a risk factor that's a favorable thing that may regress some sleep apnea cases in children. So the answer here is C. All right, now for the third question. Go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So this one's a little bit tricky, especially if you're not too familiar with sleep apnea or some of these terms. And while the answer may not be immediately clear, we can reason it out using some logic. So OSA means that the patient is waking up frequently through the night and just generally not sleeping very well. So if we go through these answer choices, somnolence means excessive sleepiness, being drowsy during the day which is kind of hinted at in the chief complaint. Even if you didn't know that though, perhaps you've heard of the word insomnia, which means difficulty sleeping. And that S-O-M-N root is in both of those words, in insomnia as well as somnolence. So you might reason out that it has something to do with sleeping. Anyway, we can definitely rule this out as that's a key feature in OSA. Headache is definitely something that could result from a bad night's sleep. Maybe you've experienced that yourself. So we can rule that out as well. Enuresis means involuntary urination, usually in the form of bedwetting. And if you didn't know that, again, like before, maybe you could locate some word roots here. This uresis might be familiar because you might know that a diuretic is a medication that increases urine production. So it has something to do with peeing. But anyway, we can rule this one out as well. It's a staple symptom of poor sleep, particularly in children. And then nightmares is a manifestation of what's called parasomnia. And it's also more likely to occur along with OSA. Now fever is kind of the outlier here, and it's a temporary systemic increase in body temperature and that's not related to poor sleep or OSA. So the answer here is E. All right, now for the fourth question. Go ahead, pause the video, think through this one, and then we'll go over it together. So this one's another tricky one, and I'll admit there's not a whole lot of information provided in this patient box. This one's pretty empty. So how do we reason this one out? Bimaxillary protrusive means that the dento-alveolar units or the teeth themselves are flared outwards or protruding outwards and or the maxilla and the mandible, both jaws are protruding outwards as well. 
So we can actually rule this one out right away because both jaws being protrusive allows for more room at the back of the throat for the airway. Class three, we can also rule out for the same reason because a normal or protrusive mandible would allow for more airway space at the back of the throat. Class two is actually a pretty good choice here. Heck, in the second question of this case set, we had a retronathic mandible listed as a risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea, which is a characteristic of some, or I should say most, skeletal class two patients, but not all of them. So some class two patients have a protrusive maxilla and a completely normal mandible. So the only one we can be sure has a constricted skeletal dimension and possible impingement on the airway is this one, bimaxillary retrusive, where both jaws are retruded. So retrusive jaws means less room at the back of the mouth, less room for the airway, and more likely to have impingement on that airway. So the answer here is going to be D. And this is an example of there being a pretty good answer, but there is a better answer, which is the correct answer. And those make for some of the trickiest questions on the board exam. All right, question number five. You can go ahead and pause the video, read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So this Malampati score is a diagnostic tool that measures the size of the tongue when it's not protruded and in a relaxed position. There's a modified version of it as well that involves sticking the tongue out as far as possible. So why this is important is a large tongue can block the posterior pharyngeal space and create problems for the airway during sleep. So it directly correlates with OSA and its severity. A Malampati score of one has the smallest tongue and the most room at the back of the mouth. A score of four has the largest tongue and the least room. So it kind of goes from least severe to most severe. Now five would be correct, but there is no five in the Malampati score. So that's a trick answer choice, so to speak. So the answer here is going to be D. And here's a diagram depicting class one through class four, and you can see how there's the least amount of room for a patent airway in the class four situation. All right, and the last question of this case set. So go ahead, read through this question, think through it, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so first things first, don't worry if you don't know what a positive airway pressure nasal mask is. The key here is the direction of the force being applied and the point of application of that force. So it's being applied to the nasomaxillary complex, or we can simplify that and just say to the maxilla. And the elastic pressure is pulling downward and backward toward the neck. So let's go through these functional appliances and figure out which is the most similar to this direction and point of application of the force. So reverse pull headgear pulls the maxilla forward to correct a skeletal class three malocclusion with a retrusive maxilla more specifically. So that one is just plain wrong. It's pulling in the wrong direction. Cervical pull headgear is strapped to the back of the neck to pull the maxilla down and back, restraining its forward growth. So that one actually sounds pretty good to me. Let's go to high pull headgear, and this one is going to be strapped to the top of the head to pull the maxilla up and back, once again, restraining its growth. So that one's wrong. We, we're looking for something that's pulling back and down. And then how about combination pull headgear? So this one actually combines cervical pull and high pull headgear to pull straight back towards the bottom of the scalp area by the occipital protuberance. So that one's not quite right either. We're looking again for a down and backward force where that strap is coming to the back of the neck. 
and that's going to be most similar to cervical pull headgear. So the answer here is B. And here's a picture of what cervical pull headgear looks like. And in this question, it was saying this particular nasal mask is applying pressure to the nasomaxillary complex and pulling towards the back of the neck. Now there are nasal masks that strap to the top of the head, but this question has indicated for us where it's pulling to. So we can confidently answer this question with all the available information. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.